That's a very, always a very interesting combination, and especially living where we live and the kind of people that we all are, because we're sort of pre-sorted. You don't actually live in this part of the world unless there's something in you that is strong-minded, generally intellectually oriented, but it's a, a, a place where that kind of energy just vibrates all around us. People are inventing and creating and uh, accumulating and innovating. And all of that is just marvelously fun. Um, I've lived now in this area for three decades. Prior to that, I lived out in a, the rural Nevada County in Ananda Village, which was really quite isolated. And it was m m m a major change of energy to suddenly be driving down El Camino instead of just walking down the hill from one part of Ananda Village to another. But as soon as one sort of gets into the flow of energy in this particular area, one of the reasons we're sitting in this building and have as, as expansive an energy as Ananda has here is because this is an area where people are very creative and very innovative and have a lot of imagination and have a, what is very helpful sense of money as energy. So many people in this area are self-made in terms of personal uh, assets and wealth. And so their recognition is that energy and money are very similar and that we don't have to be afraid about hoarding or accumulating because we can always generate, generate more where this came from, which was out of the creativity and the attunement of our own spirit. So as a consequence, it's quite sophisticated in this area and I've always enjoyed it. It just, um, uh, people have such interesting stories and do so many interesting things. And I think also we've become to a very large extent the Dwapara model for the world. If you just walk around, well, you can just look around this room, you see nationalities and you see cultures and you see languages. The little street where our community is, little Monroe Drive, for many years at Christmas Eve, we go knock on doors and sing Christmas carols. So I know the, I've watched the mix of the neighborhood. Now during COVID, everybody walks around and walks around and you see, um, there is no dominant culture in this area. There is no dominant, well, there, I, presumably English is the language, but I've actually read that statistically, there's three cultures here. One is Spanish as a first language. Second is Asian in every way you would call that. And the third is everybody else. <laughs> Lots of whom are Russian or European or whatever. I don't, you don't really quite know the words for any of this anymore because it's all just coming together in this new reality. But the other aspect <clears throat> of a, living in a dynamic place like this where there is so much force to influence the world, we become, um, we can easily become distracted on the question of what does real success look like? What does real intelligence look like? I think we're actually still in a much more positive picture because people are so creative. And when you're creative, you recognize that there's another force that's moving here. It's not just a question of, I just find out sort of how it's done and then I do it. It's um, as I'm very fond of quoting Steve Jobs' famous remark when people asked him if he should do market research to decide what products Apple should make. He said, how do people know what they want? I haven't invented it yet. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth in that because we are in a time that's really shifting. We're going into a new age of energy out of an age of fixed forms and, and angels and spirits and superconscious energy is hovering a half an inch away from our little brains just trying to make suggestions to us of things that haven't been invented yet but that we're all just ready to have. I mean, the, the speed of innovation is truly startling. 
And there's all these problems on this planet. Everybody knows about it now. The poor school children are just being inundated with the responsibility for saving the planet when all the adults they rely upon have been too stupid to be able to do it. But they're 10 and they're supposed to be able to do it now. It's not having the positive inspirational effect that people hoped it would. In fact, it's scaring some of those kids to pieces. But others of them know that they were born to save the planet. And they're just trying to grow up fast enough to be able to do it. And when you start really investigating, there's amazing, brilliant ideas. Some of them are innovative, some of them are just going back to traditional realities that all the problems could be solved, all the technology is there, all the resources are there. What's lacking is the heart to do it. They're just the heart isn't there to do it. And that's our job. I mean, that's my political activism, which I've been engaged in for 50 years now, which is we have to change consciousness. We have to live in this world bringing with us all of these great qualities and these great qualities of comfort and there's no harm in living um, without having to just spend so much energy doing the fundamentals. But I was watching a friend of mine who was staying in my house for a time and um, uh, it was Van Mali Devi and her cousin Mohan, for those of you who know them, they live they, they moved to a remote village somewhere above Rishikesh, I believe. And they have to haul all their own water. And it came time just to do the breakfast dishes in my very comfortable house. Um, uh, Van Mali says, uh, you know, let, let Mohan do it. He really knows how to do dishes. And the Mohan knows how to do dishes with no water. <laughs> He turned on the tap and he, he made a, like, smaller than a pencil, this little tiny, little tiny thread coming down and he cleaned all the dishes extremely well. When uh, David James reminded all of us that California is in a drought and made a few suggestions, I actually realized you don't need a stream of water that's that big. Actually, a stream of water, smaller than a pencil, actually works perfectly well. And it reminds me of how much abundance and luxury and so on, and how many other things are possible if you just live in a different world than this one. But it's not constriction that I'm talking about now. I'm talking about how do we open up to this superconscious flow, which is always around us. This is the odd thing about superconsciousness. We project an anthropomorphic, a kind of, uh, is there an, an an anthropomorphic that's like called the crummiest part of human beings. I don't quite know what that is. But we take and we project upon the greater reality the most narrow attitudes that we have. This world is a reflection of who we are. So, you know, God must be a lot like us. And we project upon him narrow-mindedness and bigotry and... Um, an unwillingness to give. It's the, the radical reconfiguration that is required for us to really understand and embrace this path. Well, there's a line in Yogananda's poem, Samadhi, and he's, it's the phrase, beyond imagination of expectancy. And it's a marvelous phrase to use in lots of different ways. He's talking about the bliss of God consciousness. He calls it enjoyable beyond imagination of expectancy. But part of our difficulty is that it's a very radical, very radical, very radical, <laughs> complete repicturing of where power comes from, of where happiness comes from, of what success is, and how we go about achieving it. And that's the reverse, the negative reverse of all this sophistication and intelligence and so on that just surrounds us here, is that a certain childlike enthusiasm is harder to come by. Many years ago, a friend of mine, Arati, and I, this would have been like in the late 70s, Swamiji was doing a tour around the country and I was, I was organizing the trip and to a certain extent publicizing it, but also organizing it. 
And this was long before the age of the internet, and so actually human beings had to relate to each other and people actually had to go places. I know that sounds quaint, but that's what we did, <laughs> right? And Swamiji was, had, let's see, he was, he'd gone across the country and he was coming back, and he was going to be in Denver. And so Arati and I drove from California. This was not particularly efficient, but it was more fun than doing it in any other way. We drove to be the advance team. So we get to Denver, and we're making contacts with lots of uh, different spiritual groups there and lots of different things that were going on in that city at that time. And uh, we had to go. We made some contact with some very uh, prominent, uh, wealthy people, and there was some kind of a gathering at this house, and we got ourselves invited, and we felt exceedingly like country bumpkins, just... I mean, our clothes, all of our clothes at that time were so funny, it took me a while to figure this out. Because we all shopped at the second-hand store, the Goodwill store. It wasn't like any, wasn't like the classy consignment stores in Los Altos that I discovered when I got here. These were just charity stores. And we go to charity stores. Now, I'd lived out in the country for, like, by this time, 12 years or so, and I've never been much of a fashion maven. So we go to these, these charity stores and we're so pleased because there's such classy good stuff in there because it was popular the last time we paid attention. <laughs> so this is like my, my favorite junior high outfit. I can buy it right here, right now. So we always looked like we were doing it deliberately, but what were we thinking? You know, it was sort of like, <laughs> like why? So we're, we're standing outside the door of this big mansion, and we've come from our little trailers, you know. And uh, we were sort of a little nervous. I was maybe 25, 27, something like that at that time. And we're both just standing there. We're, we're a little nervous about ringing the doorbell and just sort of entering. It's a world that we'd never been into. And I loved it. Arati looked at me like this. She's very feisty. Childlike joy is always in fashion. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> so we just rang the doorbell and marched in. And what do you know it was? <laughs> you know, it's like everybody in this world, no matter who they are, no matter what position they are in, no matter what facade they put on, underneath it, we are all exactly the same. And we are all children of God, we're all longing for that reunion with our divine selves. And some people cope in this world better than others. It's just the karma of things. I, I, you know, some people just know the system. They know how to play it. I was really good at, this, at playing school. I knew how to play school. I was just born. I don't ever remember learning to read. Everybody in my family could read. I could always read. I don't know, I don't know when it happened. I just went to school effortlessly. I never really excelled, but effortlessly I could just do it. It was just something I was born knowing how to do. And it was exceedingly nerve-wracking for me because it took nothing from me to be able to do that. And the response I got was so out of proportion to the effort that I was putting in place. It, it actually made me exceedingly nervous for many, many years of my life. But it was just sort of the beginning of, and of course I was born to be a yogi, but I was looking for truth. I wanted true security. I could tell just because people thought that this was a good thing, I knew it wasn't. It wasn't that it was worthless, it was very, I'm very happy to have had that inclination in myself. It made for many interesting conversations with Swami Kriyananda, I'm extremely grateful for it. It's not like I'm scorning it. But it wasn't what I was born to do. And I wasn't really born to do anything. None of us are. We're born to realize that we are loved by God. If you knew how much God loves you, that French saint said, you would die for joy. Why do we want that? Because everything else we intuitively know just comes and goes. It's just people's opinion. They love you today and they don't like you tomorrow. You know, Swami made a comment once about Michael Jackson when he was tremendously popular. The context was the children 
and I hear the only point of this story is simply this. I always have to say, before Michael Jackson, you know, became hated by everyone, remember the time when he was still loved by everyone before everybody turned on him and hated him? Like, surprise, surprise, when Elvis Presley was happy before he got so miserable and became whatever he became and then fell. Before how many? They rise and they fall and they rise and they fall. It's like the opinion of the world nowadays. People just lie and wait if anybody is popular or admired and there's just a whole army of people who are just waiting to drag him down. You know, that's just this awful world we live in. Praise and blame. What we want is to be seen, to be recognized, to be known, to be loved. And fortunately, there are good people in the world, and we do find friends, and we do find people who really take us as we are and love us. But the heart, the heart is always longing. This thought brought me powerfully onto the path. I believe it was when I was 18 that this happened to me. I had never seen anyone die. I hardly knew anything about death, but gee, if you factor in reincarnation, probably we've done it before. What do you think? Like how many times over and over and over? Some part of me knew it. It's very interesting. I'm sure all of you have these experiences. You have these breakthrough moments before you really know anything. And then you look back and you realize, I knew it. I didn't have the words. I didn't have the concepts. But I knew. And I remember this night in my late teens when I just thought about dying. And what I captured was actually very vivid and very real to what I've come to believe is the experience from being with others and from meditating on it. And it is an ever-increasing separation from everything. No matter, you know, and I, at that time in my life, I thought I would, the, the only thing that interested me was raising children. It seemed like that would be worth doing. So I was figuring that I'd have multiples of children, you know, just lots and lots of them. And I, of course, of course, part of the fantasy is that I would be a perfect mother and that they would all be perfect children, you know, interesting, artistic, all these things. So the picture of my life from the time where I was having this experience to the time when I would die, which is what I was thinking about, was going to be filled with interesting human experiences and love and understanding and respect and blah, blah, all those things. But it wouldn't make any difference because I would be there and I would shrink and shrink and shrink from this world. I never thought of the death as frightening. And I don't think I had much philosophy then, but I somehow knew that something else would happen. So it wasn't scary. In fact, the whole thing wasn't scary. But I tried to think, I guess the word is, if I could take any of that with me, if I could take the security provided by external realities with me at the moment of death. I wasn't clear enough to think about consciousness and vrittis and karma and all that. But all the things that people hold on to to make their life count, I tried to think if I could take any of it with me. You know, now you think you get to the heavenly realms and they say, ooh, he was the CEO of a really big company. You know, and all the angels come around and they're very impressed. It's ludicrous. It's a joke when you say it, but we live as if it's not a joke, don't we? And that's, that's our foolishness. And I resolved at that point. I needed, <clears throat> I needed something that would not be lost to death. And to, this is always, death has always been a very interesting subject to me, not even slightly morbid. I just think it's fascinating. We act as if it's not going to happen, and we act as if everything that we're accumulating is going to stay with us. People die with housefuls of stuff, and their poor relatives have to spend months, you know, just sorting it all out afterwards. Why? I mean, it's just it's a very good question. Why? Why do we do what we do? 
And is it really smart? Smart in the sense, really simple sense, not in the smart of all the smart I was talking about a little while ago, but is it smart in terms of giving us what we really want? So the Bible now talks to us about suffer little children. And I, I heard a line, I've heard this reading, you know, dozens of times. This was a verse Master often quoted. Masters here in materialistic America, where wealth and status is so important, 1920 to 1950. This was not like the Age of Enlightenment yet in this country. He was really plowing a, a pretty hard field at that point. And he often quoted, be therefore as little children. So children are fundamentally inept and not very capable in just countless ways. So certainly we're not um, complementing their facility in this world, except it's worth remembering your consciousness and actually your intelligence is not a question of how, uh, how your, what the stage of your body is. Even if you can't, if you have no language, it doesn't mean you don't have soaring spiritual understanding. So consciousness is quite different from uh, the ability to express yourself. But what is the characteristic of little children that master would always recommend, which is they know what's important in many very fundamental ways. And they're fearless, ideally, they're fearless in their capacity to love. And they're also, um, in, in a very real sense, undiscriminating in their capacity to love. We know lots of really terrible people whose children love them right? <laughs> you know? Or babies. You, you, you see sometimes some, <clears throat> someone with their, the child, <clears throat> and you can tell that this is not a person that a lot of, an, an adult that a lot of people automatically love, but the baby loves. You know, the mother gave me life. The mother fed me. Mother picks me up. Mother changes my little wet diaper. She does everything that is needed. My father provides for me. You know, they're there and I love them. And I rejoice in everything that happens. And of course, I cry and I have tantrums and I have to deal with stuff. But I just keep whatever's in front of me, I just keep going through it. And I don't confuse myself with all these extra ideas. You know, I keep focused on the main event. The main event for a child is to grow. I, I read an extremely touching story. There's a community in Sonoma County that I know just from their writings. It's a very small community. It's called Star Cross. And uh, it was founded at the same time Ananda was founded by this man and two women. And they set themselves up in a little monastery and they mostly sort of Christian Catholic oriented. They've done lovely work. I've tremendous admiration for what they've done. And at a period of time, when, because they were, they're local here in this area, when AIDS was really just sweeping across and babies were born with AIDS, people really didn't know what to do with these children. And so that community, that became one of the things they did. They took care of children that had AIDS, that were treated as if they were sick. And so they were hospitalized and not given a childhood because often they didn't live long. And these wonderful people just took a lot of these children in and took care of them until they died. Almost all of them died as children. But here was the story. One of the children they had was an infant. Usually they came a little older. This, this child was an infant and he was really sick. And finally he had to be in the hospital because he wasn't going to live very much longer. So in the evening, his first, his first tooth broke through his gum. You know, that's, I, I've never raised children, but that's a big moment. The child is working really hard, and he is working hard. It's his little body, he's making his teeth. Teeth are so important because you can't graduate, you know, into doing anything unless you have teeth. So the first tooth broke through, which is a cause for great celebration. All the people who love this baby celebrated, and the next morning he died. But look at that. It's like he was con determined and he was going to keep growing until it was over. 
Now, the thing about children, you see, is they, they have no choice. Whether they're well raised or badly raised, whether they're loved or, or, or not loved, whether they're happy or sad, they just keep growing, don't they? Time passes and he's two and he's four and he's seven and he's 29 and there it is. Whether we grow internally, whether our consciousness grows, now it is also automatic. But we can monkey with the system and mess it up a lot more. It's automatic in the sense that we will never be content. We will never be content. That's why we love someone and then they disappoint us and then we love someone again and then they disappoint us and we love someone again and this one works and you know we just do it over and over because we long for that. But much deeper than that, much deeper, the soul is there. And the soul is like a river to the sea. It's a river to the sea. We can dam it up, we can divert it, we can spin it into whirlpools, we can dissipate it across the meadow, but the river is going to make it to the sea. And our reality, our single purpose, is to, is to cooperate with that and to discriminate between that which is taking us toward what our heart really wants and that which is taking it away from there. And unfortunately, it's not as automatic as the teeth breaking through the gums because free will and fear and free will and fear and free will and fear let us just go like this a lot just a lot of the time, even when we know Arjuna says to Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, why is it seemingly against our will that we know that is the light, that is the goal, that's where I'm going, but suddenly I'm over here, <laughs> you know, and I don't know how I got here. But as soon as we know, we just pick ourselves back up and keep walking. All you have to do is persevere. That's all there is to it. You just have to persevere. You don't have to be any good at it. You don't have to look good. You don't have to be admired. You don't have to have any grace or technique. I, I have, it has been attributed to Master. I don't know if it's true because I never heard Swami say it. The Master says you don't have to stride triumphantly, you know, across the goal line of your tests. He says you don't even have to walk slowly or crawl. He said, you can slither along on your belly as long as you keep going. I love that myself. Because some days, that's pretty much about all you can do. Sometimes you just lie there and look in the right direction. <laughs> that's how I've always said, it's not a question of how quickly you're moving. It's just that you're facing in the right direction. It's really okay even just to sit down and contemplate whether or not you have a choice. As long as sooner or later, we recognize the reality of this and we simply must go to the light. Uh, Swami said to us once in this wonderful satsang he gave, he said at the end of it, his, his consciousness was extremely elevated that evening particularly. And he, he looked out at this room. It was his living room at Crystal Hermitage. There was probably 30 of us in the room at the time. It was one of those winter nights, you know, where it was just the little gas lights, very romantic sort of setting. And he goes across and just looks at us all like this. I really think he looked at every one of us that night. He said, you're going to get it right sooner or later. He said, why waste a few million years? <laughs> oh, okay, sir, we'll try, we'll do our best. That's the best we can ever do, isn't it? And Divine Mother loves us for trying. God bless you, my friend.
Mm-hmm.